All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a treat for you guys today. We are joined by the host of the Big Bass Podcast, the host of Bass After Dark, bass fishing historian, probably I would say the top pick for anybody for their fishing trivia team. Right, I think I think Ken's probably up on that list. But ladies and gentlemen, we have the one and only Mr. Ken Duke. Ken, thank you so much for joining us today. Andrew, thanks so much for having me. I'm a big fan of Tackle Talk, and, and uh, I know we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm excited to do the show. So again, looking forward to this. Well, thank you. And I know I told you when we were texting back and forth before we started this that I'm very excited for this. I know there's a lot of people that are going to be really excited because the people that seem to listen to our show are these, and I say it affectionately, like true fishing nerds. Like we are just how much more info can you give us? Leave the BS at home. Leave the drama at home. We're more like how much info and it, there's there's nothing that's too quote unquote boring because this is the stuff that I think a lot of people don't get other places the conversation we're about to have today is not something you're going to see from you know your favorite flashy YouTuber or whatever this is the stuff that if you really want to soak up info this is uh, going to be a conversation that people want to listen to yeah I really hope so because I can't give you the spinnerbait tips that Kevin Van Dam can offer <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you deep cranking tips like David Fritz has or, or anything that Edwin Evers or somebody like that might offer but but if we want to talk you know, bass fishing history and things like that. I'm all in. So we'll get to the, probably people can tell by looking at the title now of what this show is going to be about. But before we get to that, we're going to make them wait a couple minutes because I have a couple questions. I want to kind of get to know you more and let the listeners kind of get to know who you are and your background. So to give you a little background, I guess the very first time that I ever heard you talk about bass fishing in general was this is probably four years ago at this point. Uh, Mark and Matt had you on BTL and I fired up my you know YouTube to tune into BTL in the morning as I always did. And it said, Bass Talk Live with bass fishing historian Ken Duke. And I sat there and I listened to it. I remember just being captivated by, I mean, I can remember little bits and pieces of you brought out a, there was literally a trophy with like a leprechaun riding a, a oh, bass yeah, or something. Yeah. You said, this is one of the first, you know, Bassmaster Classic trophies and uh, all right of here. these stories and, you know, artifacts and everything you had. I just remember just sitting there and being glued. Yeah, there it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that's the kind of stuff you sit there and you get these really cool, interesting stories and nuances to the history of bass fishing that I wasn't hearing other places. So I just remember being infatuated with it. When did you first start realizing that you sort of had this interest in bass fishing history and started to go down the road of, I guess, kind of preserving the history of the sport? Oh, what an inter what a good question. And and one I really haven't had asked of me exactly that way before. Um, you know, I, I, I like to say that I'm interested in history generally, but that's probably not true. There are certain aspects of history that really fascinate me. Uh, and bass fishing is one because I'm very interested in bass fishing. Baseball was one. And, and I probably was a, a baseball fan as a little kid because my dad was a baseball fan. And, and as I got more into fishing, I, I thought, you know, wow, this, this sport must have a history as well. And I wanted to learn about it. So uh, back when I was a kid, back in the, the 70s, it was a lot easier to uh to track down the history of bass fishing because the ba bass fishing history was still relatively new and, and and as always being made but but i i realized that as much fun as i was having tracking stuff down there wasn't as much of it as i wanted i was i had a bigger appetite than there was supply and so that made me look for ways to uh learn things that weren't being published other places or or talked about and so I, I kind of made it a mission to uh, get to know the people who had been making bass fishing history and to read as much as I could. And and so I guess I, I really started getting into it as a teenager and and have never stopped. If anything, I think the appetite's bigger today. I'm guessing that's a weird time, too, because there weren't too many people like now. If you go to, you know, iCast or go to whatever, there's a billion media outlets. There's a billion people sort of trying to do the same thing with their own little lanes. Was it a different time back then where there weren't a whole lot of people covering or preserving the history so you had access to things that no one was even trying to get access to yeah it's a, it's another great question because it's something i've thought about a lot actually the internet has changed everything with regard to media and and quite often and, and in some ways for the better uh because now anybody who really wants one has a platform whether it's andrew hayes or ken duke or someone else back when i was a kid let's or, and really getting into it in the 70s and 80s, there were fewer platforms. There were magazines like Bass Master, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, Sports of Field, um, the Game and Fish magazines and so forth, and a lot of other magazines as well. Um, 
And, and so if somebody told you, I read everything out there, I read everything there is about bass fishing, they could have been telling you the truth because it was a very finite universe. Now, of course, anybody who tells you that is exaggerating or, or just outright lying. Um, but what I think, what I, and, and that's great that there's so much more out there and so many more platforms and, and people can get into it on a very personal level. Where I think it hurts today is now with so many different options to get into the sport, it's hard to find good content. Um, to get to Tackle Talk, you probably had to wade through 10, 20, 30 shows that are not nearly as good, not nearly as authoritative, not nearly as well done. And I think that's the challenge. Uh, if you had a platform in the 70s and 80s, it was probably because you were an expert and you knew what you were talking about. Today, it's probably because you have a computer and a keyboard. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's a shame. Yeah, it's uh, I always talk to people now where like it is information overload, like these people that go out there and they try and find info. And the other thing, too, is when fishing is a a non perfect, I don't even know how to word this, but it's not a perfect science, right? It's an art. No. And so if you ask people, you know, you ask 12 different people the same question, you can get 12 different answers. And so that's where these people that are trying to learn, you know, I think back in the day, probably there was at least a little bit of simplicity where you only had four or five outlets that were giving you an opinion. Now you have 2000 outlets that are giving you opinion and uh, 1500 of them are categorically wrong. 500 of yes. them, uh, <laughs> you know, might be yes. some version of right, but it's up to you to decide. So yeah, that's, it definitely becomes tough. And now everybody is so, um, biased, I think, toward anything ah. that's gear related, like you have to, and people are getting smart about it. They're learning to look for people's either explicit or implicit bias and say, who's this person working with? Why are they only recommending this one rod or this one reel or this one brand of baits? And you really, it, it's kind of a shame because you don't get these people that just come to you and say, I like this crankbait because of this. I like this crankbait because of this. I like this spinnerbait because of this. It, now everybody's got some sort of agenda to them, it seems like. Everybody has an agenda, and I think that's always been true. And one of the interesting things to me about media in the outdoors is uh, it's all positive in the sense that uh, very few media outlets, very few media personalities, very few professional anglers, want to be professional anglers, influencers can afford to say anything negative. Because if you say anything negative, you're gone, you're done, you're not going to have the sponsors, you're not going to have the advertisers, you're not going to mm -hmm. have the support. As a result, our industry of outdoors media is is not as reliable maybe as it could be in, in a lot of respects. That's a shame. I wish our industry was stronger. I wish it could support um, some of the negative where the negative is truth, uh, but it's not there. And I don't expect it to get there in my lifetime, unfortunately, hopefully in yours. Yeah. I, it's funny you mentioned that. I just put out the episode that's coming out today as uh, we're recording this was a, a true real review and there was some negative in there. And it's the same thing, people aren't used to hearing the negative side of gear. So anytime they hear something negative, it's, you know, it's a shot at somebody or it's, you know, it's like people are just used to reviews being fluff pieces now and PR pieces with people that they're working with. And they're not used to someone saying, here's the four things I like about it. Here's the three things I don't like about it. You usually don't hear the three things you don't like about it. And it extends beyond gear. It extends yeah. to the personalities in the industry. I mean, we, we know who we admire. We know who we follow on the tournament trails and so forth. Well, well, please realize that these people have the same problems that the rest of us do in society. There are people who have substance abuse problems. There are people who have marital problems. There are people who have all kinds of issues in their lives, but you're not going to see it because there's no market for it. Okay, I do have a random question for you here. What do you think is, because I know we talked about you have the history side. You also have physical items in your possession that are the <laughs> history of bass fishing. And obviously I, I hinted at one of them the Some very first that, thing I yeah. saw you. What is the weirdest thing you think you have in your collection in terms of like a bass fishing artifact? Wow. You ask, uh, you ask some tough ones, Andrew. <laughs> tough ones. You know, one of the ones I, I get the biggest kick out of, and I think it's out of my reach right now, but uh, back in back in the the late eighties, early nineties, a, a woman named Sandy DeFresco caught a fish that uh, was very close to the world record. But when it was cut open by the taxidermist, they found a two and a half pound dive weight in it. And for a very brief period of time, a company was manufacturing this San Diego big bass kit 
which consisted of a little dive weight. And I've got one of those here somewhere. And I think that's kind of a weird thing to have. Um, I've got a lot of oddball kind of books, uh, many of which have been inscribed to me that I get a kick out of. I've got some, uh, one of my big heroes in, in the world of bass fishing is a guy named James Henshaw, who wrote the first two books on bass fishing. And I think should be regarded as the greatest writer in bass fishing history. I've got some of his medical letterhead where he's, because he was a, a physician. Yeah. And uh, he's he's writing to somebody about some topic medical related. And I've got some of those letters and I think those are are amusing. I actually own the correspondence between George Perry, who caught the world record largemouth allegedly yeah, in 1932, allegedly. and uh, his correspondence uh, with Creek Chub Bait Company, which made the bait that he allegedly caught the fish on. I, I own the correspondence. And, and some of those things are kind of offbeat and weird and, and amusing to me. That is cool because I don't know a ton about the George Perry stuff, but there was some discrepancy. Like there wasn't a photo and then now all of a sudden he's talking with Creek Chubb and there is a photo and the photo's not him. And was it weighed at the post office versus the, the general, general store? store? Yeah, all that and kind of stuff. So you have some of that stuff. That's so cool. I've got, I've got quite a bit of that stuff. Um, and I've got a very strong opinion on Perry. And one of these days, Andrew, one of these days, I'm going to take him down. Yeah, <laughs> I've from what little that I have like fully dove in and looked at. It's a, a fishy story, let's say, to say the least. Ah, no yeah. pun intended. But yeah, yeah, it is it's a very fishy story. And, and the sad irony is that uh, in 2009, when Matabu Kurita caught a fish that was almost a full ounce heavier, um, his story is pretty bulletproof. And, and I think that's the guy who should have the world record, but another conversation for another time, maybe, uh, we gotta, we gotta do a deep dive on that on the big bass podcast one of these days. Yes. Okay. Next question here before we get to our, uh, moments in bass fishing history. Yeah. I, I mentioned, so you might be like, if someone put a gun to my head and said, pick somebody for your bass fishing trivia team, it's Ken Duke, like Ken Duke knows more Thank than I, I think it's probably possible to fit in someone's head in terms of bass fishing knowledge. Who, if I said, Ken, you have to pick two other people to be on your bass fishing trivia team, who else is in that realm where you trust them to go up and say, all right, let's, let's put together a trivia team. Oh, uh, Terry Battisti, who yeah. is my partner on the big bass podcast. Uh, Terry is uh, an amazing, uh, bass fishing historian. He has his own website also called uh, bass hyphen archives.com. He's, he's right there. Um, Rick Pierce, uh, who runs Bass Cat Boats. He and his dad founded Bass, Cats, Bass Cat Boats decades ago, and uh, he knows a ton. Uh, those guys are, are frightening. I mean, they, they occasionally say, I could take you in a bass trivia contest. And, uh, so I say, okay, but got to put big money on it or I'm not going to play. Right. You're a sports guy. Do you remember the yeah. show on ESPN called Stump the Schwab or Stump the Schwam yes. or whatever it was called? That's who Absolutely. I picture. When I think of bass fishing, I think of Ken Duke as the Schwam. Like, you know, <laughs> on there, it's, it's the guy that's sitting in the chair where like all these kids think they have a chance to stump him at some, you know, obscure 1972 stat about the San Francisco 49ers. And he's just like, got it. He's like, no, not even close. I don't know if I'm as good as a Schwam, but, uh, and, and, you know, it, I, I take a lot of pride in in knowing some things about bass fishing history, and I get very frustrated uh, when people are in a position where they should know or need to know, but don't know, and have an indifference and disrespect for the fact that they're not knowledgeable enough to do that job or perform that task. Those people really bother me. I have a, an overinflated sense of, of justice sometimes, Andrew. It's a problem. <laughs> Well, the last question here before we get to the history is, and I want your opinion on this because I think I've thought about this before internally. I think you're probably a good person to ask this question because you've seen throughout the decades the way that fishing media has changed and the way that yeah. the forms of media, whatever, like the mediums of bass fishing have changed sure. as well. Do you think, I think we're at a really special time right now in bass fishing in terms of the media and record keeping and documenting things because we've made it to the point where it's lasted long enough where now we have things like this. We have podcasts, we have YouTube, we have this yeah. ability to capture these long form conversations with people, but we're also still young enough in a sport where 
the forefathers of the sport, many of them are still around. So you've got like we live in a time where, you know, long form conversations are normal. But the Bill Dances, Hank Parker, Denny Brower, Rick Clun, um, Johnny Morris, like all those people are still alive where we get the chance to still have these folks that are on the Mount Rushmore of our sport still be around and involved in the sport. Do you think that way, too? Like, do you think we're at a really cool crossroads of those two generations? I do. And I feel very fortunate that I, I've kind of had the opportunity to bridge some of that. You know, I had a chance to know Ray Scott very well, spent a lot of time with Ray. I, I knew Tom Mann. I'm such a fan of, of guys I call friends like uh, Bill Dance, Hank Parker, Rick Clun. Uh, I've been enormously fortunate. I think that um, I, I think that the media aspect of it all has changed so much over the last 20 years or so. And some of that's been good. It's wonderful that we can capture these guys on audio and video and, and more so wonderful that it's so easy to share it because I think there's always been a fair amount of of footage and content like that, but it hasn't always had a platform to share it like YouTube or, or the internet generally. Um, I think that one of the challenges though is so much of, the internet is is vanity type programming. It's not so much about maybe telling a story or relaying the history as it can be about me, me, me. And and part of my frustration in that is um is in the people who you know, I'm spoiled. I've worked with Kevin Van Dam and Edwin Evers and Mark Davis and Skeet Reese and Mike Iaconelli. And so when I want to learn something about about a technique, I will quite often go directly to those guys. And, and to think that a guy who, who might not even be as good an angler as me is holding himself up to that same level is frustrating. And I, I'll, I'll never forget the first time it really hit me that, that Internet 2.0 was that platform. Uh, I was the uh, senior editor of BASS Publications, and I was in charge of the web. And we had just posted a story on how Kevin Van Dam fishes a spinnerbait in the springtime blah, blah, blah. And, and in the comments section, I got these people who, of course, we've never heard of saying, well, Kevin should try this. And I'm thinking, unbelievable. These guys are now, because they have a keyboard, because they have an internet handle, they're now telling Kevin Van Dam what to do. And I thought, this is, there's no turning back from this. This is not great. Yeah. There's no credentialing anymore. Right. No, there used to be, no. like you said, if you got a job at in Fisherman or you were writing in the pages of in Fisherman, you'd been vetted. Yeah. People knew yes. that you knew what you were talking about. Now there's no vetting. It's you can go online, you can start throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks and you get a couple thousand followers. And now all of a sudden you are a voice that people trust. And it's like sometimes those people shouldn't be in that position sometimes. So true. But, you know, you used a, word, a great word there in vetting. Uh, I think there is an informal vetting today that is is simultaneously wonderful and unfortunately perhaps hackable. We have people who are succeeding, like Andrew Hayes with Tackle Talk, like the Tactical Bass and guys, Matt and Tim, like uh, Gene Jensen with Fluke Master, who are being vetted by the public at large and because they're finding an audience that is sticking with them, we can rely on those guys. Those guys are good. They're educators, they're knowledgeable, their heart is in the right place. They're properly motivated. Um, what bothers me are the people who are clickbait and who are finding an audience through clickbait. That pisses me off. Uh, I have no respect for that as a tactic, and I have no respect for those people. I think they are parasites on the sport rather than contributors to the sport like, like you and like the other guys I was just mentioning. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Luckily, I think people are starting to get hip to it where, you know, 20 years ago, you bought whatever so-and-so told you to buy. And now I think everybody's put on the glasses and say, no, I probably need to be a little bit more skeptical about who I'm listening. Or I don't think there's anything wrong with if if you are going to get your information from biased sources and people that may or may not know what they're talking about, then you just have to cast a wider net. You can't listen to just one YouTube channel or just one podcast or just one whatever. Now you got to go out there and you got to find you know, 20, 30 different sources of information and then compile all those and say, where do they overlap? Where do I think that the truth lies? Because it's somewhere in the middle of all 30 of these somewhere. Well put. I often think about 
getting into the sport now versus getting into the sport like I did in the in the late 60s, early 70s. You know, nobody in my family really fished except my grandfather, but he didn't bass fish and he didn't live in Florida, which is where I grew up. Um, but I was able to take these bite-sized steps into the sport. I, I sometimes imagine what it would be like to be a young person a day walking into a big box store like an Academy Sports or a Bass Pro Shops or a Cabela's and being blown away by all the options there and having no real clue as to where to begin, how to put these things together. Uh, you almost wish there was a Sherpa at the door who could lead you down the aisles. And, and, and the same problem when you go to YouTube and you search bass fishing. My God, how do you, how do you get through that morass? I don't envy young people trying to get into the sport today. Um, and, and it's probably no surprise that growing the sport is the biggest challenge we have right now. Well, there would be no growth without the past. And we are going to talk today about, and I'm, again, I'm geeking out about this because this is awesome. We talked <laughs> before. You said uh, that you have put together what you believe are the 10 most important moments in bass fishing history. And so we are going to go to Bass Fishing History 101 today with Ken Duke, and we are going to get your top 10 Mount Rushmore of events that you think were the most influential to leading us to where we are today in the flourishing of the sport. And we're going to do it in chronological order. Yeah, when uh, when Andrew invited me to join the show, I was very excited about that. And uh, we were just kicking some things around. And I said, well, how about I come up with a top 10 uh, most important events? And and Andrew seemed to bite on that. So uh here we are, and I'd never actually done this before. I thought about it, but I'd never sat down and, and, and forced myself to have the discipline to come up with it. I'm actually very excited about the list. And, and I think I can absolutely defend the list, but I would also say that, that uh, probably a lot of other people who I would consider experts would have a slightly different list, but a lot of commonality too. Well, are you ready to jump in? Let's, Let's go it, to the first event that you think makes your top 10 in chronological order of the most important moments in bass fishing history. What is the earliest moment you have? February 25, 1871. There wasn't bass fishing a lot in the way we think of it today, certainly. Uh, but there was some bass fishing. There were people who had rods and reels and they they fished for bass, mostly with live bait. But on February 25th, 1871, uh, President Ulysses S. Grant appointed a guy to the uh, the U.S. Fish Commission, made him the head of the U.S. Fish Commission. And the guy's name was Spencer Fullerton Baird. And Baird was an interesting guy. He was an ornithologist and a naturalist. He, he was the first uh, curator of the, or maybe the second curator of the Smithsonian Institute. So a very, very... A uh, well-connected, uh, knowledgeable guy in the world of nature, and and especially birds, but to a degree fish. And um, as he takes over the U.S. Fish Commission, one of the things that Congress charges him to do is to spread food to the frontier in the West. And he thinks, well, how am I going to do this? These people have buffalo, and they have deer, and they have squirrels, or whatever. But one of the ideas he has is he's going to load up fish in big wooden barrels, put them on, you know, steam locomotive trains and ship them west. And whenever the train stops to pick up water or coal or something like that, he's going to have his people or train railroad personnel staff dump those barrels into the waterway there because all the stops are basically going to be at rivers so they can pick up water for the steam engines. And so that's what he did. And he did it indiscriminately. He's loading saltwater fish in here. He's loading <laughs> trout, cold water fish, warm water fish, whatever they can load up, they're loading up in these barrels from all across the Eastern seaboard. And they're heading West. And they're dropping them in the water. And sometimes they're dropping saltwater fish in a, a, a river. And these fish are floating up in a few yards, dead as a hammer. <laughs> but sometimes, and sometimes he's dropping cold water fish in a warm water fishery. Or warm water fish in water too cold for them. And a lot of these fish are dying. And there's some, there's some cool correspondence between him and his underlings. Where they're saying, hey, a lot of these fish aren't making it. <laughs> 
And he says, I don't care. Does not matter to me. They told me to ship food west. We're doing it. That's all there is to it. Uh, but because of Baird, largely because of Baird, other people later too, but largely because of Baird, a fish that was basically just east of the Mississippi, a, the largemouth bass was just basically east of the Mississippi, up into parts of Canada, around Ontario and Quebec, and parts of Mexico, and he helped take the bass across the entire United States. I mean, now there are bass in, in 49 states, uh, and he is to be credited with that in, in no small measure. Of course, he's also responsible for European carp, but that's another story. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll forgive the bad for the good. <laughs> so where did he get the fish at? Where were they coming from? Anywhere they could get them. They'd get, okay. them out of the, they'd get them out of any river. And of course, there were very few reservoirs then. So most of these fish are coming out of either natural lakes or they're coming out of rivers. Uh, if they're coming out of Florida at all, and Florida was not too heavily, uh, did not have a lot of railroad track at that point, but they're coming out of natural lakes in Florida. So he's getting them wherever he can. And of course, not just bass, uh, bluegill, pike, uh, all kind of saltwater fish. Whatever they can get, they're loading them up. They're shipping them west. They're dropping them in the rivers. So I got a weird one then. How did we know that there weren't largemouth already out there? There are no reported uh, incidents of largemouth before this period. And there were a lot of naturalists traveling out west. You know, even with guys like Lewis and Clark, they were trying to keep track of what new animals and fish they found and 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 others. So uh, the naturalists were not finding uh, a lot of these fish out there pre Baird in 1871. Do they think there were any other species that he helped like grow? Like obviously the largemouth survived in about everything, but like some of the trout or whatever, do they think that that had anything to do out west or they think pretty much it was like largemouth were the things that survived? No, no, it was largemouth. It was it was bluegill. It was a lot of stuff that were only eastern fish prior to that. It oh, was bluegill even weren't even out west. Well, I, I think they were very limited in their range, at least. Um, uh, perhaps crappie. Uh, there were even some saltwater fish that did not that were not known to exist in the Pacific until Baird. And there's no evidence that this man ever caught a bass in his life, or or had any interest, or could have identified one in a lineup. But but he did more to spread the fish and make it kind of the nation's fish than, than anyone hands down. The Johnny Appleseed of largemouth bass. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And, and of course, not just largemouth bass, but primarily of the bass species, that was the one that obviously did the best because the largemouth is, is the most adaptable. And, you know, today, and, and I'll, I'll get into this in a, in a little bit, but today the largemouth bass is the, um, uh, the most widely distributed freshwater fish in the world. Yeah, I mean, it's making its way into every hemisphere of the world now, right? These countries that 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago wouldn't even thought about largemouth bass. Now you've got them in uh, Japan. You got them everywhere. They're, it's it's a global phenomenon now. Well, that stuff happened longer ago than you realize. Um, no. And that's my next, that's my next uh, oh, top Oh, sorry. I didn't want to spoil it there. All right, all, right. <laughs> all right. So moment number one, you said that was what? 18... 1871. 1871. Okay. So yeah, we are quite appointment... a ways back. Yeah. The appointment of Spencer Fullerton Baird as um, first commissioner of fish and fisheries for the U.S. Fish Commission. That's that's number one. Not now. Again, these are not in. in I didn't want to go through them in, in a list of importance, Andrew, because so many of them build on each other. So many of them are not possible without some of the earlier ones. So I thought it only made sense for us to do it chronologically. Yep, I would agree. So 1871 is our first moment from there. Where do we go to moment number two? We're only traveling six more years. We're going to 1877, whereas Baird was responsible for taking fish and, and spreading them across the U.S. Um, uh, in 1877, you have the first incident of, of bass being distributed outside of North or Central America. Uh, this Because as, as I mentioned, prior to 1877, the bass was just, or prior to 1871, the bass was just Eastern uh, parts of Canada, parts of Mexico. Um, Baird takes them further west, but in 1877, um, they are distributed to France. Why yeah, France? Because because somebody in France, <laughs> seriously, it, it's this it's this nebulous. There were some scientists in France who had come to the U.S. and and who had um, been been naturalists who were collecting specimens, and they decided, hey. 
this fish could do well in our waters. And so they loaded some up in barrels, in tanks, whatever they could, and they, they shipped them. And when we say ship in this case, we mean ship <laughs> in a boat. And they hauled them to France. And the first incidents I can find of, of bass being taken outside uh, the continental, continental North America, basically, was 1877 in France. But by, by 1925 or so, they're in almost every continent except like Antarctica and stuff. Um, they're in Asia, they're in Europe, they're in South America, they're in Africa, they're just about everywhere. Um, certainly by the, the mid 20th century, but mostly by 1925, they are pretty much in every continent. And, but it started in 1877. That's when the bass goes, you know, worldwide, I would say. Do you know how they were shipping these? Like back in the day, did they have air raiders or how are they keeping this fish alive? Well, that the mortality rate on these things was through the roof. The mortality rate was probably 95%. Um, but they're loading them up in barrels. There's a lot of sloshing around, of course, on the ship, some movement and so forth. And that will actually help to aerate ah, the water. That makes sense. So, so aeration becomes less of an ordeal. Uh, if they shipped them in, in colder weather, the water was cooler. The metabolisms were down. They probably had a greater chance of survival. Um, they may or may not have tried to feed these fish during the trip, but we know bass can go quite a long time, especially if the water is colder without eating. You know, it, it would not be unusual for a bass in great habitat and cold weather to, to go a week or more without eating. So that strikes me as being less remarkable, but but the mortality rates were through the roof. So how long do you think, uh, you probably said it there, but I, I missed it. How long from the time that France gets introduced to this becomes a worldwide phenomenon? Is that 10, 15 years, 20 years? It's gradual and, okay. and, it's, uh, and it's piecemeal almost by continent. Um, you, you get a tremendous amount of European spread between 1877 with the first incidents of these fish going to France. And there is evidence that none of them survived ultimately. They were planted but did not survive. But within another year or two, uh, they're all over Europe. By, by 1881, uh, they're pretty much in, in a lot of, of developed European countries. Uh, by 1925, they're, they're pretty well distributed in parts of Asia. And, and it, it goes from there. And, and shockingly, you know, you've got them in parts of, of Africa and, and so forth by by the very early 20th century at the latest. So we were nice enough to take over the best sport fish of all time to a place like know. Europe, and they're still obsessed over carp and perch and things like that. What is it? Why, why don't they get it through their head that there's a lot more fun things to chase than the same mirror carp every other I'm day? I'm with you, man. I'm with you. But you know what? I, I had a chance to go to uh, uh, Japan and the Osaka tackle show a few years ago as a guest of the the wonderful folks of gamakatsu and also i was the only american uh media person on that trip but there were media people from other parts of the world where gamakatsu is is offered and uh i was thrilled to talk to some hardcore carp guys and and i learned so much about their sport and how passionate they are and today, when I think of, of passionate anglers, I got to rank those guys ahead of us. Uh, they're, they're crazy. They're out of their minds. They'll spend, it's nothing for a serious carp guy to spend a uh, two or three week vacation traveling to another body of water in another small European country and to fish not for carp, but for a single individual carp that has distinctive markings and a freaking name. Yeah, they name them. <laughs> that's hardcore and they've that's got the hardcore, little like we will never see they've got the little thing with the you know the two handles where they keep them all wet and the little almost yeah. looks like a hammock type deal that they have and yeah it's it's a different world over there but you're right they'll go and they'll be like i'm taking a two-week holiday and i'm gonna go to <laughs> you know <laughs> target uh that's it. bessie yeah. over here because i know yeah, she exactly. lives in this pond you know 200 miles away from me exactly 
And that that's a level of seriousness that I don't think that I don't know of any bass fishermen having. Um, and, and I talked with the Gamakatsu engineers and, and, and people in the manufacturing aspect of their, their operation there, which is very impressive. And I said, who's the, who's the most serious about the hooks? You know, who's the pickiest about their hooks? And I said, are the bass guys there thinking, surely we are the most picky about hooks. No, we are not close. We're not close. The carp guys are the most serious. They'll want, they'll want Teflon or some particular material on the outside of the point, but not on the inside of the point. They, they take it to another level. Meanwhile, I have a uh, specialized bow downstairs to shoot carp with. <laughs> <laughs> you would be on a wanted poster yeah. if, uh, <laughs> if you were in, in Europe right now because, yeah, they take it very seriously. And as you say, they take fish care yeah. uh, to another level as well. Yep. Okay, so that is moment number two. We have 1871, 1877. We are going down the, uh, the path here, and we're making our way down chronologically. What is moment number three? No, moment number three is July 1881. And I know after three elements here, we've only gone 10 years, but it's going to pick up. Trust me on that. Uh, in July of 1881, James Henshaw, who I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, published the Book of the Black Bass. And this is a replica. I've got, I've got uh, a number of first editions from 1881 as well. Uh, but I was looking through that because uh, it's still a book that fascinates me. It was the first book ever published on bass fishing. Henshaw also wrote the second book ever published on bass fishing, which is called More About the Black Bass. And uh, it contains the greatest line, I think, in, in all of, of bass publishing. Uh, Henshaw said, and he's speaking about the bass generally, not the large mouth, not the small mouth. There's a lot of people think he's talking about the small mouth. He's not. He's talking about both when he says, I consider him inch for inch and pound for pound the gamest fish that swims. Um, and it's important because before this, A, there had never been another book written about bass fishing before this. B, the bass was almost universally disrespected as a sport fish. People considered the bass to be trash. They thought it, it, it lived in these fetid, nasty, overgrown alligator and snake infested waters. They thought it was second class in every way. Uh, and, and as a result, they, they completely disrespected it. Um, but it was also important because Henshaw was a monumental figure in bass fishing, both before, because of his writing, and after these books. Uh, he became involved, even though he's a Cincinnati, Ohio physician, you're yeah. in your area, we need, we need to make a trip one day. Um, but also because this guy got to work in the fisheries industry after this, and, and he was the first to raise bass in captivity. Um, he designed the seminal go-to fishing rod of the 19th century. Um, he was he was the man in the world of bass fishing. There's really no one who we could point to and compare him to today because he was perhaps the greatest bass angler of his time, the greatest bass writer, the greatest bass designer and innovator. Uh, he was all of those things wrapped into one, and he was also kind of the Nostradamus of bass fishing. He predicted the rise of the bass. He predicted the fall of trout as a game fish because of dams being put on all these trout waters, because of the, the loss of habitat for trout, because of pollution, and because of invasive species. He knew all this. He was talking about all this in 1881. And uh, the publishing of, of Book of the Black Bass, I think, is, is easily one of the top 10 moments in bass history. That's cool. So the first two moments are kind of like the spread of bass. This is really where the love affair with bass kind of starts. And it starts with this gentleman right here, James Henshaw. And to the point, you you held up Book of Black Bass. I know, uh, to give people some background here, we met for the first time down in Houston, Texas, probably a month ago. And you told me this story about James Henshaw. And I, this was the moment where it was just like, I, I there's so much I don't know. And you told me, me about too. it. And I'll, I'll let you uh, tell you a little bit about it. But it's like the connection that James had to Ohio and specifically a body water that I still fish today to the point where I have the book of black bass that should be delivered on Saturday. I have it on order and it uh, ah. should be at my doorstep. So I can't wait to read it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Andrew and I got to talking, he, he mentioned he was from Ohio and I thought, wow, that's a, that's a ground zero for so much bass history. Uh, Henshaw was actually from Baltimore, Maryland, but when he was a very young man, his family moved to uh, 
moved to Cincinnati. And, um, and so he would make trips back and forth when he was in school. And, uh, and on one of those trips, he, on a train, uh, he overheard some people talking about bass. Uh, one of the conductors was talking about bass and, and he, he picked up just enough of it to intrigue him. He knew he liked fishing and this bass thing sounded very interesting. So he goes on to Cincinnati and he meets another guy who can tell him about bass fishing and maybe teach him a little bit. And, and the guy tells him, he said, well, yeah, well, let's just take the train to Morrow, Ohio. And, uh, and they got off at Morrow and they, uh, they went to what, I guess the little Miami river there. Yep. And, uh, they got off the train and, and this guy, this was July 4th, 1855. And this guy introduced Henshaw to bass fishing with live bait. Henshaw caught his first fish. I think that's the most important fish, individual fish in bass fishing history because it, it really spawned. Here's another pun to throw in there. It really spawned this seminal figure's love of the sport. And uh, it spawned these books. It spawned these developments to raise fish. It spawned uh, rod and reel design. It, it, it did so much for the sport. And it all really got rolling in Morrow, Ohio on July 4th, 1855. Um, and, and yeah, Andrew's right there. Andrew has no excuses. So one day, I think, let's do it. Let's do it on July 4th. Let's do it some July 4th. So we can recreate Henshaw. We'll take a train. We'll get off at Morrow, Ohio. We'll walk down to the river and see if we can catch a bass. How cool is that to think about? Like I've floated probably every foot of the, you know, little Miami at some point in my life, most of it anyway. So like the fish that we're dogging on that are here, you know, there are these little 12, 13 inch small mouth on these days. It's like that fish could be the great, 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 great grandson of the fish that started bass fishing forever. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what that fish could be. That fish could be a descendant of, of the, the fish that James Henshaw caught in 1855. And, and I just think now you could go really nuts and you could try to do it with period tackle. I'm not going to do that. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have, I'm going to have contemporary tackle. I'm going to make it a little easier on myself, but yeah, that's something I've been wanting to do for a number of years and I just haven't pulled the trigger and done it. And I also want to go to Cincinnati and, and visit some of the, the addresses where Henshaw lived and, and the locations where, where his medical practice was, where the publishing house was. I realize a lot of those places are gone now, but, but I still want to, want to feel a part of that history with him. Yeah. It's so cool that we're able to trace this back to what probably is the first person, right? I mean, it's, it's very hard to do that with a lot of things in the world now, like whatever your hobby is. It's very hard to pinpoint the one single person that probably tipped over the first domino that then started this whole thing, but we're able to kind of trace it back to this, you know, what, whatever he was, a doctor, you know, from around this area that, and it's cool. You have his paper and the- Yeah, the, I've got his letterhead. The yeah, letterhead medical... from whatever that is, 150 years ago. Like, it's it's crazy to think about, yeah, that's- that's a long time ago. It's also crazy to think that 150 years ago, two generations, a generation and a half ago, our sport not only didn't exist, but people weren't even thinking about targeting the fish that became our sport. Like we are still such a young activity. In a lot of ways we are. Yeah, it's hard. I can't argue with you there. In a lot of ways, it's a very young sport. It's certainly a young sport when you consider uh, the trappings and, uh, and paraphernalia that we typically associate with modern bass fishing. So moment number three on this is really the gentleman that gets the love of fishing and the, the train start rolling here and writes the book literally about bass fishing. So that's moment number three. Where do we go from moment number four? Okay, finally, we're going to take a kind of a big jump chronologically. We're going to go to March 4th, 1933. And uh, that is the day that Franklin Delano Roosevelt is inaugurated as president. He was elected to four terms, of course. That was the beginning of his first term. And that was important because um, uh, America was in the midst of the Great Depression. Uh, people were in bread lines. People were out of work. Uh, they were struggling to feed themselves. There were not enough jobs out there for people. And, and Roosevelt's solution for this, love it or hate it, support it or, or think it was a bad plan, was something he called the New Deal. 
I'm not advocating for the New Deal. <laughs> I'm not telling you I'm a, a Democrat or a Republican. I'm not saying I'm a Franklin Roosevelt fan. I'm more of a Theodore Roosevelt fan for what that's worth. But uh, Roosevelt's New Deal was all about putting people back to work. And one of the things he was going to do this was by creating the Tennessee Valley Authority, by the WPA, the Works Projects Act. And, and what a lot of these people were doing in those programs was building dams. They were building dams. And they were building them for a couple of reasons. One uh, was rural electrification. For the most part, if you didn't live in a, a fairly decent-sized metropolitan area, there was a chance you didn't have electricity. So these hydroelectric dams in the middle of relative nowhere were a way for you to get electricity. Um, for another, they these efforts created jobs, of course, put people to work. For another, they created flood control. You know, our rivers, you know, if you think about rivers overflowing now and flooding, it's nothing like they did 100 years ago before there were all these dams and things on there to kind of control some of that. And of course, the next thing they did was they created an absolute wealth of bass fishing. You know, Andrew, when we look at, at other things in nature, we tend to think, oh, I bet it was amazing 200 years ago when, when there weren't all these people and stuff like that. Well, bass fishing is not like that. We have more bass fishing water today than we have ever had at any time on the planet. And, and a lot of that bass water that we enjoy today came about during what I, what I would call the America's dam building era, which began when Roosevelt took office in 1933. We're at a point around here where it seems like they're trying to take out more dams than they're putting in. And they're trying to, you know, I'm going to use air quotes here for people listening, like restore back to <laughs> natural, you know, habitat or whatever. But yes. The thing that people don't realize, especially I'm a river rat. So like when you start taking low heads out of rivers, you deplete all of the capability of that river to hold depth. And now it becomes back to this three inch deep, but floods to 50 foot, you know, when it rains versus a place that keeps this seven, eight, nine, 10 foot depth and good habitat for bass. And we're starting to see, at least around here, we're starting to see a turn of the tides where it seems like the attitude from... You know, I'm not a political guy, but like government and that type of thing is more we want to take more dams out than we want to put dams in. And the the importance of dams seems to kind of be going away, especially on river systems. Absolutely. I'm even seeing that here in Florida where you don't think about a lot of rivers uh, and you can even turn to a degree. I think you can even turn a warm water fishery into a cold water fishery just by by removing dams. And and, you know, I'm I'm all about nature, but at some point. You, you've reversed the process of nature so much. I have, I'm challenged to see the virtue of, of reverting. Um, a lot of the species that you, you claim to be trying to protect or politicians and, and do-gooders want to protect are, are gone now. And they're replaced by new flora and fauna. And, and now you're destroying that. So there's a, this is anecdotal, but there's a river pretty close to my house that uh, used to be have a couple low head dams on it. It was a great smallmouth fishery. It was awesome. I can remember being younger and, you know, these places were, you know, chest high or more and we were weighed around and you'd catch a bunch of fish and they slowly started taking dams out. And now that water, what used to maybe be, I don't know, a five foot normal pool in like some of these areas is now literally like six inches and it's yeah. so small. And then when it floods, I'm not kidding. The gauges will go up from like a, you know, six inch to a foot pool and it'll go up to like 35 feet. Like it is just, it's completely blown out this whole river system. It doesn't hold anything except it's overrun with forage. So craws, uh, darters, things like that. They're all over the place now because the predatory fish don't have the depth they need to really live there and stay there year round. So it's, it's a shame to see. And unfortunately it seems like that's where everybody wants to go because they want the, the kayak, you know, uh, the, the float and drink type crowd. Like they want to be able to float this whole nice river and it's going to bring in all these tourism dollars and everything, but the grass is not always greener on the other side. Those dams were there for a reason. Yeah. It, it, and you know, I think every generation has their, um, has their agenda. And, and so things swing back and forth. I'm now old enough to realize that. I'm not sure I would have realized that at your age, but, 
Uh, I, I see it more now and oh, I, I get it. I get it, but I don't have to like it. You're right. Okay. That was moment number four, FDR. Obviously, uh, the United States is dam building era and, you know, the, the vast more places that we can fish, the more bass rich water that we were able to create with that. So that's moment number four. Where does moment number five take us? Number five may be the most, uh, I don't know, the most unknown, the most underappreciated, the most uh, under the radar of anything on my list. And that uh, I'm going to put another specific date to it. April 24, 1935. It's only two years after FDR takes office. Uh, and what I want to talk about here is what are called cooperative wildlife resource units. And a lot of people may not know what that is. It wasn't that long ago that I didn't really have a grasp of that. And I had to, uh, uh, I got an education on it from my friend, Patrick Pierce, who is not only a wildlife biologist, but uh, a fabulous fisherman and one of the smartest guys I know. Um, but on that day, April 24, 1935, a political art cartoonist of all people named uh, J. Ding, there's my air quotes, Ding Darling was what his what he went by. Uh, he hosted a dinner at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. And he, he brought in a lot of bigwigs, a lot of people with money. And he was trying to get he was trying to gather support for a program he had in mind that would produce wildlife biologists and and biological information for wildlife management. And and these cooperative wildlife research units, uh, they're combinations of land grant universities with wildlife programs and and various state conservation departments and and what they do is they are helping to fund uh the education of biologists who are who quite often are able to attend school uh without paying a tuition and maybe even getting a bit of a financial stipend to help them through they also get a chance to work with potential employers you don't make a lot of money as a wildlife biologist typically but there's a program there, thanks to these co cooperative wildlife resource units, whereby a, a young person can get an education and, and get a foothold in that, that world and that industry. Um, so what happens is uh, these states were, were not, they didn't have a cohesive set of units to try to manage their natural resources. This gave them one. This put all these land grant universities like the University of Georgia, uh, Auburn, um, Texas A and M. It, it made them a network. It made them work together uh, for technical and biological guidance and assistance uh, through finding a workforce that could populate and, and and guarantee that that good information was being relayed across the country for management, not just of our, our bass and other fish, but also of, of wild game. Without that, who knows if we'd have anything approximating it or when we would have it. Um, but I think that's a, a really key moment. Yeah, because that obviously spawns everything that we have today, all of the good management uh, best practices and resources. Like there's no, you know, Texas share lunker program without that mean there's none of that right and the other thing that's weird too sometimes is like you you made me realize this earlier when you were talking about like the kids online telling kevin van dam that you know how to throw <laughs> a jerk bait a certain way that's like me we we have a lot of armchair quarterbacks when it comes to biology and conservation and you know i can sit here and complain about the odnr not doing this right not doing this right but it's like i'm some schlub on my couch that goes and fishes you know a couple times a week these are biologists these are people that have gone through you know these wildlife resource centers and everything they know their best practice it is asinine for me me to think that I know a 50th of what these people know. And it's because of this 1935 event you're talking about here. Well, you're, you're a very knowledgeable angler and you take it very seriously. So you're certainly a cut above, but yeah, to show respect for the people who have made it their career and, and done the study, that's where I'm at. And, and we're no different in Florida where, where anglers tend to think that there's too much spraying of vegetation, but anybody out there listening, uh, if you know, a wildlife or fisheries biologist, there is better than a 90% chance that they got their degree from, from one of these land grant universities and that they earned it 
with assistance from the Cooperative Wildlife Resources Unit. And when I say better than a 90% chance, it may be way over 90%. Yeah, I would encourage most people, like if you haven't had a chance to talk to someone at your state agency, like we were talking about this before we started, right, where people just don't pick up the phone and talk to people anymore. And I wish that people would. I had a a much bigger respect for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Avrat, I got the chance to talk to two, three, four people that work there. And it's so evident. It's like all the things where I say, well, why don't you just do this? It's like, well, there's 27,000 reasons why we don't do that, kid. And let me tell you like 10 of them. So it's like they they have <laughs> reasons for everything. They're not, you know, dummies up there. Everybody has been credentialed like we talked about earlier. Everybody knows what they're trying to accomplish and they're doing the best they can. And they really do have our best interest at hearts. Yeah, you might get frustrated when maybe they're not showing up at the lake and ticketing the guy that's keeping over his limit every day or whatever. But in the big picture of things to make sure that you have good fishable water, you have good healthy populations, like these agencies are doing that. Great advice. And I would also encourage people uh, to attend any public functions. Uh, There are usually public meetings to discuss any significant rule changes to your fishing and hunting regulations. If you have questions about that or you think they're going down the wrong path, attend that meeting. Uh, I guarantee you they pay attention to how many people show up and which side of the issue they're on. Uh, They are not in the business of pissing you off. They're in the business of providing the best possible resource uh, for the community. And if they don't don't understand that the community wants ABC, then there's a great chance they will enact XYZ. So get out there and participate. Yeah, we're all guilty of that, right? We sit here and complain about things, but then there's, you know, the meeting that's 30 minutes away that you could go to and make your voice heard and say, no, I'll just stay at home and complain on Facebook instead. And that'll get it done. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, I, these guys don't read Facebook, nor perhaps should they. No. Okay, so we are halfway through this list and we have the spread of bass fishing. We have the gentleman that kind of fostered the love of bass fishing. We have more fishable water through FDR. And now we have these agencies that are protecting the conservation and they are investing in the biology of these fish to make sure that obviously everything from here on out is smooth on the agency side. So halfway through, where is moment number six taking us? Number six is going back to a major personality and media person in the world. Uh, Henshaw died in the 1920s. Uh, He lived a very long life, almost 90 years, and he was productive almost to the end. But uh, he could carry the ball only so far. And in 1946, uh, a guy named Jason Lucas was appointed as the fishing editor of Sports Afield magazine. And back then, there were three big outdoor magazines in the U.S. They were Sports Afield, Field and Stream, and Outdoor Life. They were called the big three, and they were the big three until relatively recently. They were big, the big three certainly until through the 90s, until the internet caught up with so many magazines and, and wiped them out. But uh, what was significant about Lucas becoming a fishing editor at Sports of Field was this was the first time that a bass guy had one of those jobs. It was always a trout guy before that. Henshaw had, had beaten and beaten and beaten on the wall. But uh, it wasn't until the 40s, when the dam building year is going, when uh, a lot of the trout habitat's going away, that one of the big three says, wait a minute, we better get a bass guy to head up our efforts here because we need to keep up with this burgeoning bass market. And, and Jason Lucas was that guy. He was certainly the best bass angler of his time, in addition to being the best bass writer. He once fished 365 days a year for bass. He once did it for a whole year, never taking a day off. Uh, He wrote the seminal book on bass fishing of his year. It was called Lucas on Bass, first published in 1947, republished in 49 and 62. Um, And he was, he held the position of fishing editor for Sports and Field until 1968. Uh, So he had, he had a 22 year run. He was, fantastic. He was a, an absolutely critical person. I've, I've often called him Bass Fishing's PR man. And I think that's a fair statement. How long did it take the other two of the big three to catch on to this? Like Sports and Field is the first one to kind of say, okay, the tide's sort of turning here. Let's get a bass guy. Were they pretty stubborn on that or did they change pretty quickly? It was weird because these were not jobs like president where there's an election every four years. Quite often a guy would get this job and he would have it until he died. 
it was a little bit like, like like being a Supreme Court justice, you know, you're you're almost appointed for life. And so the other trout guys would hang out, hang in there till the 60s. And uh, and then other people would be appointed. Uh, but but after after those run of trout guys kind of ended in the 60s, it was bass guys from then on guys like Ken Schultz for uh, uh, Field and Stream or Jerry Gibbs for Outdoor Life or after Lucas, who had sports a field from 1946 to 1968, it was Homer Circle. So by the by the late 60s, early 70s, the tide had turned and it was all bass guys. Got it. Interesting. Because that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. So it sounds like the 40s to the 60s was close where it's starting to turn and people being like, OK, right, let's at least start paying attention to this more. It hasn't happened yet, but this was the first big shot across the bow. And then over the next 20, 25, 30 years, the whole thing happens. That is exactly right. That's a great observation. Got it. And then you said his book, too, because I'm writing some of this down because I do want to check some of this out. You said Lucas on Bass. Lucas on bass and I've, I've got multiple copies, but they're over there. I'd have to get up. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a great book, but it's very dated. I mean, he's talking about gear that, uh, for the most part, people have not used in, in many, many years. Um, his observations on the behavior of the fish though, are still very strong. Um, the gear stuff is, is largely to be dismissed. The boat stuff is, is, can be dismissed. It's more of a, a quaint, uh, look back for that. But his comments about the, the behavior of the fish uh, were spot on, not significantly updated in some ways to this day. And he had some hilarious uh, statements that he made that you could never get away with today. I'll give you one now at the risk of offending <laughs> a significant part of the audience who are, are women and girls. Um, he would answer questions in in his column in Sports of Field. One, one time he got a question uh, do you think I can teach my wife to fish? And his response was, I, I suppose you could teach her to row the boat. <laughs> I mean, imagine somebody saying that in yeah. 2024. Different that, times. <laughs> that, would not go over, that would not go over well. You get smacked with that oar is what would happen. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 you know, deservedly so. But, uh, but Lucas was an irascible, an irascible guy and uh, uh, a key key figure in the development of, of bass fishing. So now we're getting into print media. We're getting into, again, the turning of the tides here. And that leads us to moment number seven. Yeah, moment number Now, print media has been around uh, since the mid-19th century, even for the outdoors. Outdoors publications were huge, even in the mid-19th century. Uh, but yeah, but finally, the bass world is, is starting right. to take over a bit with Lucas. Great, great point. To, uh, point number seven is just a few years later, 1949, and it happened close to you, Andrew. It's uh, Nick Cream and the Wiggle Worm. Uh, Cream Lures is born. Uh, Nick Cream, you 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 live in an area where rubber and tires and, and things for the automotive industry were so heavily manufactured and developed. Well, Cream was was in that world too, but he was also an angler and he wanted to develop a soft worm and people had been playing with that idea for more than 50 years at that point, but had never come up with anything of significance until cream developed the first soft plastic lure that he called the wiggle worm cream still makes that bait. They call it the scoundrel. And, um, even though I'm, I'm, I'm making this key point being 1949, it really took about 10 years for the plastic worm to take off as a, a serious bass lure. Um, yeah, people were buying them. Yeah, cream lures was still in business, but it took about 10 years for a, another key development in, in the plastic worm world to take place, and that was the development of the Texas rig. Um, the Texas rig comes from Texas, the, the Lake Tawakany area, and until guys figured out, hey, we can throw this in the heaviest cover, they're cheap, bass love them and and we can have a pretty good hookup rate suddenly the plastic worm took off and it took off to such a degree that cream moved his operations from the akron ohio area to texas where they are to this day 
So isn't there some discrepancy on who was the first soft plastic worm? Like, I think there's there's at least one other company, I can't remember their name, but it was here DeLong. in Ohio. That, yeah, DeLong, that's yeah. what it was, that has the DeLong. claim to it, that claim they were the first ones too. So where do you stand on that? And do you have any insight into who the actual first one was? I've done some research on it and and I'm fairly convinced it's cream, but but to your point, yeah, there is some controversy about it. There was also a guy named David DeLong who was making soft plastic baits at about that same time. Um, DeLong went out of business for a while, I think in the 80s, shortly after he passed away. But in the last year or two, uh, some guys have reopened uh, DeLong lures. I don't know how well they're doing. I, I don't see a lot of distribution on their part. But uh, I did buy a few of their baits online because they were still making some some lures that I thought were amazing and uh, and interesting. Yeah, they were at what this was maybe a year ago now. They were at the Cincinnati Fishing Show ah, and cool. they had a booth and a big booth there. And I went over and stopped by. And I was like, that's a name I haven't seen in, you know decades at this point it looks like and so i went up and talked to the guy and the same thing you just said right it was i think maybe two guys that bought the company or something they bought they bought the you know the rights to everything the old molds the i think molds. they had like that kind of stuff and they had some really interesting stuff over there they had a lot of the retro stuff but also a lot of new stuff that they were coming out with too i mean you saw guys walking around with worms that were you know this long like a foot and a half long worms and stuff they were selling like big ones too kind of shock value stuff but yeah they did have the old like pre-rigged you know, worms that they had over there in the old DeLongs. I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. But yeah, it's different folks, but they're still around here. I don't know how they're doing because I haven't heard anything from them since that show. But I just thought it was interesting that that name popped up again because I hadn't seen it forever. When I was the editor of uh, Fishing Tackle Retailer magazine, we published a story by Terry Battisti uh, about DeLong. And um, yeah, I hope they're doing well. I'd love to see their stuff get better distribution if they're still in business, but I, I wish I could tell you. But yeah, DeLong has a claim to being the first soft plastic bait, but I think uh, certainly in the court of public opinion, uh, Nick and Cosma Cream have kind of carried the day and, and seem to have convinced most of the bass world that they were first. Yeah, and this is where we start to get into like, you know, Nick starts working with Bill Dance and starts working with all these people. And we're, we're kind of getting into the common era, right? Where now people are being like, all right, I, I'm starting to remember some of this stuff. We're starting to get into some of the things where some of the players are still around today. And again, ju again, just showing we're what we have three more moments on this and we're in the 1950s now. So we're right in our backyard of people that are going to remember a lot of this stuff. Absolutely. And the next item is just a year later. You know, Nick Cream comes up with a soft plastic worm in 49. And on August 9th of 1950, the Dingle Johnson Sport Fish Restoration Act is signed into law. And, and that's critical because, um, well, first of all, John Dingle Sr. was a, a, a representative, U.S. representative from Michigan. Uh, his uh, daughter-in-law is currently the representative in that district. And, and a guy named uh, Edwin Johnson, he was a Democrat senator from Colorado. They put this legislation together. And what the Dingle Johnson Act does is it provides funding to state fish and wildlife agencies for recreational fishing. Uh, things like buying the land to build lakes, put in boat ramps, stuff like that, uh, to do research, do all kinds of operations and maintenance, and to do fish management. And, and Dingle Johnson and its subsequent amendments uh, are really the financial foundation for recreational fishing in the U.S., they raised over $8 billion in that time, and every state benefits from it. Every state gets money from uh, Dingle Johnson and its primary amendment, which is Wallop Bro. Uh, and that's huge because without it, we wouldn't have a lot of the boat ramps we have. I mean, imagine if your state had to do everything on its own money, on its own dime. Uh, some states would be pretty well developed. Some states would be incredibly poorly developed because they're less financially uh, set, uh, and, and Dingle Johnson takes care of a lot of that. See, this is a good example of something I had no idea about. Like I didn't know, I thought that was all my state tax dollars going to pay for every boat ramp that I've ever used. Yeah, no, actually, uh, Dingle Johnson allocates this money based on, uh, the population of your state, how much geographical area they cover and fishing license sales. So, 
the bigger states with more fishing license sales get more money. And then the state has to match 25% of the Dingle Johnson money uh, to get it, to show that they are also invested and they've got a, a dog in the hunt. Uh, but And it comes primarily from taxes, uh, federal taxes on sport fishing tackle, um, depth finders and trolling motors, and uh, uh, outboard fuel taxes. So it, we're, we're paying it, but we're also, at least this is money that we can see put into our passion. Yeah. So these kind of things don't bother me. These kind of taxes don't bother me so much. No. Yeah. Think of all of the public fishing opportunities that are available because of this. Like think of, I, I like hunting too. And think of the disparity, at least around us, in terms of the amount of public hunting land to the amount of public water that we can fish. And it's very one-sided toward the water, right? Our lakes are bigger. There's rivers, creeks all over the place where you might have a couple little plots of land here and there for public hunting. So sometimes I think we get a little jaded, but to step back and look at a map and say, there are a lot of public, you know, water that you can fish. And I think sometimes we get jaded because that amount of public water is constantly shrinking and it's never growing. It seems like it's always, you know, every pond is becoming more private. Every landowner is now more cautious because of liability and all that kind of stuff. But still, when you take a step back and you look, these things like, you know, the Dingle Johnson Act here, like it provides us with a ton of public opportunities. And every time you see a boat ramp on one of those waterways or a public fishing area in your state, know that the funds for it probably came from these pieces of legislation. So that is number eight. You kind of uh, allow us to, you know, actually put our boats in the water and fish, which is a very important part about fishing. I would, I would Huge. probably agree with that. Um, and then that takes us to number nine. Number nine is uh, 1957. That is when Carl Lawrence introduces uh, what was technically known as the fish low K tour, uh, better known as the little green box. And uh, the little green box was the first transistorized portable sonar for sport fishing. Um, and of course, we, we think about where, where it is today with forward facing sonar and live scope and stuff like that. But it really all started with that little green box in 1957. And uh, that thing sold for 150 bucks in 1957, which is a lot of money, $1,500 today. Um, but it's the precursor to every piece of fish finding sonar depth finder type unit that you can imagine and um and 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 maybe some of your listeners or, or viewers thought i was going to come up and i was going to say something like forward fill forward facing sonar is one of the 10 biggest well a i think the jury is still out on that and and b no it, it's the little green box because the little green box is what started us down down this slope are you trying to make the argument that technology has always been ever changing since, you know, the 1950s and the latest and greatest thing is not always the end to bass fishing? Uh, touche, sir. Touche. Amen to what you just said. Interesting so, nuanced so take you have there, sir. Those are <laughs> those are rare nowadays. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's unfortunate um, that that nuanced takes are, are <laughs> a little more rare than they should be. But, you know, the, the story about electronics starts here. It starts in 1957. Before 1957, if you want to know how deep something was, you had to drop a weight and a string or a line down and count it. Uh, or you had to guess by the lay of the land on the bank. Um, there was no other way. And in 57, that all changes. The fish locator, is it like a glorified flasher, basically? Well, I wouldn't, or a I wouldn't less glorified it, flasher, probably. A less, yeah, it's a less glorified <laughs> Perfect. It is a less glorified flasher. Exactly. It's a more primitive flasher. Although I think you could argue that the flasher maybe did not improve that much from its introduction in 1957 until, say, the late 70s when it started getting taken over by, by paper graphs and later LCD graphs. Um, but that's exactly what it was. And, and, you know, hey, the flasher was the first live sonar. Mm -hmm. it, it was much faster than a graph of any kind. You didn't have to wait for that image to start to appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Boom, that that diode was was flashing and you could tell exactly what was going on. Yeah, well, any, anybody who's ever ice fished, like, I mean, that's still the predominant technology today. Yeah, you might see every once in a blue moon someone out there with live sonar or whatever, but most people are out there with a Vexlar on a five-gallon bucket still using it to this day. That's what we use. And it is, it's awesome. It is 
real time as fast as can be. And if you're fishing vertically, it is, I, th- I would rather have a flasher than I think if I would rather have actual like ice fishing live scope. One, it's the nostalgia of it a little bit. Um, <laughs> I love the Atari style, you know, out there fishing where you don't know how big, you know, you can kind of tell how big your mark is, but not really. Like, you know, you don't have that much definition, but it is just the excitement of two red dots meeting and then feeling the boom and going up there and setting the hook. But yeah, it's instantaneous. Like even there's some delay on forward facing where, you know, a, an actual flasher of X or something is pretty much like real time. It's uh, yeah, there's still application for flashers. I know some old old school bass guys who still like to have a flasher on the bow of their boat. Uh, but that was that was a, a, a massive moment in our sport when that thing came out. So what's crazy is we are at nine out of the 10. We have one uh, place left and we are still in 1957. So you have a lot of time to play with for moment number 10 here. Where are you going to take us for moment number 10? I fear I may disappoint, but I'm not going to take us far from 1957. I'm going to take us to 1968. Uh, in 19, and, and, and I'm going to talk about Ray Scott and BASS. In 1967, before he created BASS, Ray Scott held what I would call the first modern bass tournament. It was the uh, All-American on Beaver Lake in Arkansas in June of 1967. And um, that was the first real modern competition. Ray dreamed... Of, ha- of putting bass fishing on a level of, of major sports that got television time and stuff like that. Uh, but the reason I don't say this seminal moment is June 5th through 7th, 1967, is because there had been other kind of similar tournaments uh, called the World Series of Sport Fishing. There had be- even been a 1955 tournament in Texas uh, that was kind of similar. So... I don't think that was it. What I think was it was his formation of BASS and his decision to start a magazine dedicated exclusively to bass and bass fishing, Bass Master Magazine. And the reason I think that's the moment is because for the first time, it created stars in the world of bass fishing. If you think about it, I think it's fair to say that without Bass Master Magazine, we would not know who Bill Dance was, Roland Martin, Rick Clun, Hank Parker, even Kevin Van Dam. We might not know because remember, long before the internet, Kevin Van Dam was in Bassmaster Magazine um, and on the Bassmaster television show occasionally, but only when he won. Um, you need a Bassmaster Magazine to create those stars. And I would even argue that in the world of bass fishing, until very recently, there were no stars who did not start in Bassmaster Magazine. Zero. Uh, I think a few guys since then have made themselves stars through the internet, but very few. That's a good point. I so I had on my list of things that I was going to ask you uh, if it didn't make it on here. I had obviously 1967. So I think a lot of people conflate that with like it's just an easy thing to say. Oh, Beaver Lake that was the start of bass and the start of this whole phenomenon. But I don't disagree with you, right? I think there were. You know, your point is well taken that there were some things that had happened around that time frame that didn't make that specific event so special. It was what that event led to. So we have to make the event that or the thing that that event led to the moment and not just the, you know, the precursor tournament that happened that wasn't as special as maybe sometimes we like to to conflate it. In this case, I think the medium was more important than the message. Yeah. And because, you know, without Bassmaster Magazine, relatively few people would have even known about that tournament who would have cared about a tournament in arkansas you're in a, if you were in ohio you probably didn't care i was in florida i didn't care but bassmaster magazine kind of made me care because it made me feel like it was some part of something larger yeah and so i i think i think the creation of bass in in very early 68 is is that 10th moment and and andrew that means that you got to go back 56 years to find one of the top 10 moments in our sports history, at least in my opinion. I would maybe agree with that because it's hard to argue. And I like that you did this chronologically because it makes the point that I think some people could make obsolete where it's like, what about insert anything, insert any tournament win, insert anything that you want to say. And you can point back to one of these 10 and say, it wouldn't have happened without this. Like there is no, 
Kevin Van Dam, you know, back to back. There's there's none of that stuff without 1968 and Ray Scott forming Bass and the Bassmaster magazine and the precursor of it. So everything from there on out has been just a uh, a more current version of what's happened over the past 20, 30, 40 years. I'm glad you made those points. And I, I agree with all of them. And I think that even though a lot of these 10 moments are perhaps not that sexy, uh, I, I think they had monumental impact on our sport like nothing else. And and I when I, when I started making this list, you know, I started with a lot more than 10. And then I just started putting a line through them as I realized, okay, that, okay, this is definitely in, this is in, this is in, this is in, eh, I don't know about this one. And until so I came up with 10 and I have, I have some honorable mentions, but I don't have anything that I, in my opinion, comes close to knocking these off. The only one that I had that I think you might be able to make a case for would be, we skipped over like in the 1890s in like James Hedden and the, what is it called? The Dawad. Dawajiak or whatever he's where it was like he was one of the first people at least that I've ever read that really said all right I'm gonna make a a hard bait for bass and I'm gonna stress the fact that a bass is a fighter first and an uh eater second or however he phrased that right where he's like if you can if you can tap into that bass is just in its little tiny pea brain there that it's it's an attacker, it's a fighter, it's something if you can be on the surface of the water and look like something that's alive, it doesn't actually have to be real food. That bass will go up and smoke it. So that was the only one where I thought, and you can probably make the toss up between that and if you're going to put one lure in here, the Nick Cream and that kind of stuff of who was more important. But I always thought that was really interesting about James Hedden was he was the first person I ever read to say, you can appeal to that bass's instinct of fighting versus eating. And, you know, I, that's certainly one of the moments I thought about for that 1898 uh, or 1901, right in that era, Henshaw legendarily waiting for a friend at the Dowagiac mill and he's whittling a stick and he throws a stick in the water and he sees a fish eat it. Um, but there are other guys who are, who are creating artificial lures before him. Okay. And, and so that detracts from it. What, what Hedden did so well was he borrowed money from his son, who was a successful business guy, and he, he built this uh, very important brand and, and some legendary baits. But other guys were already making artificial lures. I mean, there are artificial lures, at least going back, well, millennia in the, in the fly fishing world, in essence. And, and the jigger bob, which is a very early variation of jigger pulling that was reported in the uh, in the 18th century by William Bartram, where he was traveling in Florida and Georgia and encountering Native Americans who were taking a a cane pole basically and a, a length of of like a horse mane or something and dangling a jig in the water. So there are artificial lures going back hundreds and in some cases perhaps thousands of years. Um, and so it's hard for me to pin that and say, yes, James Henshaw is the guy. This was the moment. Was Hedden just one of the first people to like commercially sell bass lures then, like hard bass lures? He was one of the early successful guys to do okay. it. Okay. But other guys were also marketing artificial lures to a degree. Got In it. In fact, if you go to, uh, I wish I had the... Uh, if I had prepared this part better, I'd, I'd be in good shape. Uh, the most expensive lure that has ever been sold at auction was called the giant Haskell minnow. It was made by a guy named Riley Haskell, uh, I think in like the 1860s or 70s. And it was a trolling lure. It was a big metal trolling lure. And it was probably targeting fish other than bass for the most part. But the smaller versions would certainly have caught a bass. Anyway, this thing sold for like $101,000 about 20 years ago. God. And it's the most expensive lure ever sold. Well, that's that that predates Henshaw by decades. Um, and that's part of why it's worth so much is because it does predate Henshaw by decades and because there is only one that anybody's ever found. But but there were other people doing it. Uh, and and although Henshaw was wildly successful and uh, and, and even more innovative than others, yeah, hard to pin that on him. 
So I love this list. I'm going back and reading through it. Obviously, I took some notes here. So just to recap, we have 1871, the spread of the bass throughout the U.S. You have six years later in 1877, basically the worldwide start of that spread. You've got 1881, the love of bass sort of starts with James Henshaw and his book. You've got 1943, I believe it was. You've got uh, FDR as president. You have 33. 33. 1933. 1933, You've got FDR as president and really starting to beef up the water that we have here uh, to fish and, and the United States sort of dam era. You've got the cooperative wildlife resource units. So we're really starting to take seriously the biology and the conservation of this type of thing. And then you've got 1946 is uh, Sport and Field. It's Mr. Lucas comes as the editor. And then you've got 1949, you've got Nick Cream and the Wiggle Worm. So you now have the first soft plastic worm, and we're starting to get into more modern baits here. Um, Number eight, 1950, uh, Dingle Johnson, the Sport Fish Restoration Act is signed into law. So now we have this funding for things like public boat ramps and making more water more accessible to people. Number nine, 1957, Carl Lawrence introduces the Fish Locator, and it is the first uh, sonar technology that we have at our disposal. And then number 10, 1968, Mr. Ray Scott, the formation of Bass and Bassmaster Magazine. I think you're going to have a hard time finding somebody to argue with that list. Oh, come on, Andrew. We'll get a thousand <laughs> people who want to argue this list. <laughs> I don't know. Those are very, uh, it's not like, you know, there's any sort of bias or it's like your favorite angler is in here or yeah. something and you're picking one personality over another. These are truly monumental moments in terms of bass fishing where you can look back maybe 30 years from now, right? There's more impressive tournament wins. There's more impressive personalities in the sport, but none of those things happen without these 10 events. You know, if you look through that list in one way and you sort of put a check mark next to the ones that you almost cannot go fishing today without having been impacted by them. Dingle Johnson, if you launched a boat if you uh, if you benefited from any sort of building or creation that f- from that tax money, you're there. If you fish with any soft plastic lures, you're you're involved with Nick Cream. If you uh, if you use any electronics, the the little green box is is impactful to you. If if the water you're fishing has been managed by a biologist, then the Cooperative Wildlife Resources Unit's impacted you. Uh, if you fish a large reservoir, it's probably due to uh, FDR's New Deal. Uh, it's hard. To, and if you caught a fish west of the Mississippi, <laughs> you know, Spencer Fullerton Baird. Yeah. I, I, I defy anybody to go fishing for an entire year and not be impacted by some of these. I think that is a fantastic list. I think a lot of people are going to have a lot to go out and now research on their own too, and kind of look <laughs> more into a lot of these and say, wow, there is a lot out there that happened, you know, 150 ish years ago right that happened where a lot of times we think of bass fishing history and we're like well who won the 1972 Bassmaster classic it's like buddy there was a hundred years of you know things that led to that Bassmaster classic even happening so if someone's out there and they're listening to this and they say you know what i want to go out i want to seek out more information about the history of bass fishing are there places where you would send people like certain websites that are more trustworthy than others we talked about this earlier too right everybody now and their their brother has a podcast or a website or whatever are there certain ones that you trust uh terry batiste's uh bass-archives.com is, is really good on that uh there are there are some organizations like the national fishing lure collectors club the florida antique tackle collectors I would really encourage people to check out their website, but more importantly, go to their, go to their functions. Um, you're going to meet people who are immersed in not just the culture of, of fishing, but the history of it. Uh, I learned something every time I go to a function like that. Um, you'll also find books at those shows that you won't find anywhere else. You're not going to find them on Amazon. You're not going to find them in a local bookshop, but you'll find the guy who is absolutely maniacal about Bagley Bates has got a book and you can buy it there and check it out. And uh, there are some books out there. I certainly recommend a book of the black bass. I recommend more about the black bass. Jason Lucas book is terrific. Um, uh, Bass boss, the biography of Ray Scott is great. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch. Um, Steve price wrote a a book called uh, America's fish. I think it's called wonderful book um just uh j- 
just dig in, find something about it that interests you. Uh, go pick up old copies of, of Bass Master Magazine or uh, Bass Times or, um, you know, other organizations had had robust publishing histories, too, whether it's something like the Bass Casters Association or the old Operation Bass or uh, anything like that. There's there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, there's not a lot of places that really kind of curate it in one area for you, though. I wish there were. You want to know how big of a dork I am sometimes I go on eBay and I'll buy like uh you know 10 or 12 old Bassmaster magazines at a time there's no significance to them at all it's not who's on the cover or whatever I will just buy them and then get them I'll look through them each for you know 10 or 15 minutes and then I'll either put them in a pile or throw them away or whatever but going back in time I know I'm I'm terrible but throw them away a, come on I know but I mean I mean I'm not paying a lot for these things this is like you know 10 bucks for 12 of them or 15 of them or whatever. These are not collector's items probably by any means. But you go through and you look at like even the ads, like uh, the ads from 15 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever, where they're just now talking about down imaging or they're just talking about, you know, the new uh, Fluger that came out or whatever. And you're like, how cool is this to be able to step back in time and read these articles? And you'll read articles where some of them, you can tell the information is dated and some of them could have been written yesterday. So true. Uh, not a lot has changed about bass behavior, if anything. Uh, we've learned a lot more, you know, uh, but the bass is largely unchanged for millennia, you know. And and so we can still learn from the stuff that was done decades or a century ago. Um, you know, when you if you get a chance to go to an event like a Bassmaster Classic yes. or a, a Red Crest or anything like that, uh Find somebody who you recognize. You say, hey, I think I saw that guy in an old magazine or something. Go talk to him. Most of those guys are excited to, to talk to younger people, especially, and, and to see that kind of interest. Um, our sport did not start yesterday, and, and too many people believe it did. I, I've worked in offices and, and for companies where the people who were employed there uh, acted like that sport started when they got their first paycheck. And that's just not true, and that, that hurts me. That, that almost causes me physical pain to think that those people are allowed to uh, get a check and that's their attitude. That bugs me. I love that you're recommending too. Like go to a classic, go to, I went to my first one last year and I'm kicking myself that I'd never been to one before that. Like take the time off. I'm, I'm literally probably never going to miss another Bassmaster classic in my entire life because awesome. I went back there. I've Great. got my plane ticket booked to Tulsa. Like I'm not missing classics anymore. It was if you go there and you see it in person, you see on a much larger scale what I've always preached to people around here, which is like go to your local expos, go to your local swap meets or that kind of thing because you're now in a room or a convention center or whatever where you're not the weird fish guy anymore. Everybody's the weird fish guy. So <laughs> you can talk to anybody. Everybody's going to be friends. You're all obsessed over the same thing. You all have common interests where it's not like walking into a bar where you don't know if the girl, you know, likes what you like or not everybody in that room likes what you like everybody likes fishing so you get to go in there and you get to be immersed in this whole thing you make friends with anybody you walk by but then you go to the Bassmaster Classic and it's taking that and orders of magnitude different you are walking into this expo center I've been to iCast I've been to everything there's nothing like the Bassmaster Classic Expo because it's a mix of your industry people and your fans when you go to something like iCast you miss the regular Joe part of it because regular Joe is not in that room where at the Bassmaster Classic, it is anybody and everybody. Go up and talk to the owner of the lure company that you've been throwing for the past five years, right? Go pick his brain. Like you said, there is nothing more than these guys love than talking fishing and talking their products and talking why they use certain things at certain times. Like you are not a burden to these people at this event. This is what they're there for and they want to talk about. So true. And, and in some cases they're being paid to stand well, there and talk yeah. to you. So, but most <laughs> of them really love it. Most of them yeah. really enjoy it. And and those are all wonderful points. Um, we, we're in a sport that in a lot of ways can be expensive. I mean, if you want to go buy a new boat or something like that, that's very expensive. But if you just want to participate, if you just want to, um, to learn more, we're lucky because this is a cheap sport to learn more about. You can go on the internet and learn a lot of stuff for free. If you want to buy old books or old magazines that are usually pretty easy to find on on eBay or Amazon, and they're cheap. Uh, it's not a hard sport to access if you're addicted like Andrew and I are. Um, and there's so much more to it than most people will ever get out of it. 
Okay, Ken, before we let you go here, you're everywhere in terms of uh, where folks can find you and where they can soak up your information. I mean, it is the Internet is a beautiful thing for that type of thing because there is so much information out there. And you are seemingly in every corner of bass fishing Internet. You've got, (laughs) you know, the Big Bass podcast, which we've talked about on this show before, because it scratches that itch for me of just no nonsense information. I mean, I told you before we started recording, I went back and listened to the Ohio show like two days ago as I was cleaning my room. Like that's the kind of stuff that I love. So the Big Bass podcast with Terry is great. You've also got a fairly new show in Bass After Dark, which is a different side of you guys, which is fun to see. I love that you tune in and you've got you in the, you know, the big cozy uh, jacket and robe type deal. And it's very sophisticated. You look like you should have probably a, you know, a pipe in your hand, but you get to talk, you know, with I love the format of that show because you've got guests on there that may or may not know who the other guests are. They have a topic that they all bring different points of view toward. And I think that's something we don't get now a lot of days in the fishing industry is different points of view actually talking it through. Everybody's kind of in their own little silo and, you know, kind of talks about what they want to talk about. So can you give folks sort of a rundown on where to find you, when your shows are, what you talk about on each of these and just kind of, uh, Give people an idea of what they can find if they search Ken Duke on the internet. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity to do that, Andrew. Thank you. Well, as you mentioned, uh, the Big Bass Podcast, we started that back in the very earliest uh, of 2023. So we're a little more than a year in. We post one of those every couple of weeks. Uh, it's it's a historical look at, at giant bass. Uh, stories about world records, state records, major fish that impacted the sport in some way. So big kind of has those air quotes that Andrew was using earlier. Um, but it means a lot of things. And I do that with Terry Battisti. We have a lot of fun with it. It's, it's found an audience, but uh, we'd love to make it bigger. So anybody out there listening who wants to check out the big bass podcast, we're on all the podcast platforms. We're on YouTube. Um, I always, I always recommend that people try it on YouTube if they can, because sometimes there are visual elements that you don't get on the other platforms. And then, uh, more recently, uh, Brian Stockel and I have started uh, bass after dark. And I want to point out that that my part, another partner I have on both the Big Bass Podcast and Bass After Dark is Nathan Benson, great friend of mine for 20 years now. He and I worked at BASS for a long time together, and, and Nathan is kind of the tech brain of all of it. So he makes sure that it actually gets recorded and gets out there. But uh, Bass After Dark is a live show every Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern, and Andrew did a great job of describing it. What we do is every show has uh, a question, one question, and that's the whole show is about that. We don't tell you who the guests are um, and we don't tell the guests who the other guests are because we want to develop a trust with the audience that we are going to get the right people. Trust us to get the right people. Maybe you haven't heard of them, but these are the right people to answer that question. And uh, we want to keep it spontaneous so we don't tell anybody who they're on with. Um, And that's got kind of a late night talk show vibe that we're shooting for. I wear a smoking jacket and an ascot. We've got our own top 10 list. We have a lot of fun with that. Uh, that's that's me and Brian Stockler, Brian the Carpenter, uh, for you Ike Live Bass University fans. Uh, so I'm I'm doing those things. I'm I'm toying with with starting some other stuff um, that would also, of course, be industry related because I don't know anything except bass fishing, Andy. That's a sad <laughs> sad truth. But I appreciate the chance to plug those. Those are those are passion projects for me. Yeah, check them out. If you're listening to this, if you can stomach this show, you're gonna love. And either, any, either one that Ken does, because, again, they're both uh, so different, but you get someone who's so knowledgeable handling both of them with care. Like, this is not something where – and this drives me nuts, right? Everybody's got a podcast now. Everybody just fires, you know, fires up their mic and says, so uh, how – this past <laughs> weekend I went fishing and I – it's like – Do some prep, right? Have a reason for turning on the microphone. That's what I love about both of your shows is there is a very clear reason for turning on the microphone before you start recording that a lot of other shows, unfortunately, nowadays do not do. Well, I I agree with you. Uh, Unfortunately, I wish I didn't have to agree with that statement. But yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff out there that that I don't pay any attention to. It doesn't resonate with me. Um, And, you know, both the shows we do uh, came out of ideas I had to do the shows. And we wanted to do something different. I knew that I couldn't compete with Tackle Talk in, in what you do, Stop. Andrew. No, I'm serious. I can't. I can't. And I'm not going to be able to compete with Bass Talk Live on, on getting the latest uh, information from the tournaments and stuff like that. So I said, okay, what niche can I try to fill? And that's where the Big Bass Podcast and, and Bass After Dark came from. And, and I would say 
that one of my major goals for 2024 is I do not want to win uh, a swimmy for a bad reason, <laughs> uh, like worst thing on the internet or something like that. I, I just don't want to win one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I've toyed around with actually making trophies and sending them out like unsolicited to people. So they just get something in the mail and it's just this gag swimmy award. But yeah, no, I can assure you, uh, you, Brian, Terry, you're not in the running for any of the negative swimmies. I can promise. <laughs> well, I hope not. I mean, I'm, I'm working real hard here to try to avoid a swimmy, <laughs> a bad swimmy, a, a no. great, sw a good swimmy would be lovely. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely would, some would, positive swimmies that uh, you could be up for in the future. It would go up on the wall behind me, but a bad swimmy, I might, I might bury that behind some books or something and not tell people about that. Uh, well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for taking your time to come and talk to us today. And again, this is the type of information, this type of episode that we all love of getting the chance to sit down and learn from someone way smarter than us about a topic that we will never know that much about. And it is bass fishing. And I think this was a really good place for people who have that, again, itch they want to scratch in terms of bass fishing history. Where do you start? Where is this, you know, list of monumental moments where you can say, all right, let's start here and then work our way up. There's obviously way more moments that you can dig into yourself, but this is a very good starting point if you want to know the basics of how bass fishing began and kind of where to branch out from here. So thank you so much for uh, coming on today. We appreciate it more than you know. Thank you so much, Andrew. Appreciate the opportunity and uh, love Tackle Talk. So thank you.